So um, I am inviting my good friend, Professor Dr. Ian Foster. And while he finds his way here, I want to highlight that he has been a friend and supporter of Multicore World for really long time. So there is a photo on the website of him, a younger Ian, in Multicore World 2013. Um, yeah, so it's not a minor thing to have a person of his prestige coming back and back. It helps being a Kiwi, but still, you can be anywhere in the world. You can stop talking. Okay. There you go. Good. Excellent. That's enough. I, I was going to speak about your sense of humor, Thank but you. it's not Thank you, sir. So, uh, good. so uh, it's a great pleasure to be here again uh, in Christchurch, um, which actually is my alma mater, University of Canterbury. So I lived here for three years a few years ago. So I'm going to give a talk about global services for global science. Um, I, I got here a little bit late because I was out um, hiking for three days, my wife and I, around on the east coast of uh, the um, Banks Peninsula, um, which uh, in the, around the town of Akaroa. This is a beautiful picture of the, the coastline, and this is the uh, actually the interior of, of what was an ancient volcano, I think about eight, min, eight million years ago. So it's a pretty impressive, uh, pretty impressive area to, to go to. So uh, I was asked to... Um, we were, I think you said that we should each tell something unex, unknown about ourselves. So this is mine. Um, my great grandfather was the mayor of Christchurch back in uh, back in the day. I think Christchurch was about fifteen thousand people at the time, um, and so it wasn't a very big deal. And it was only for a year. But uh, anyway, um, but I know what you're thinking. You're thinking James Gates. It's that guy, but it's not because. Uh, Apparently, the year before, he ran a, a, an ad in the local paper saying that um, I am not the James Gapes that was fined for drunkenness at the resident matrix. <laughs> Apparently, that was actually his son, which is a bit sad, a sad story. But anyway, so there you go. Something you didn't know. So, um, so I'm interested in lots of things, but distributed computing is one. And, and why, why do we want to build? We've got these wonderfully powerful parallel computers why do we want to link them uh, together to build distributed computing computers? And why one reason is, uh, you know, we might want to uh, collect data from many different uh, uh, areas, uh, as, for example, in the Earth System Grid uh, Federation project. We might want to um, uh, link data from uh, field laboratories uh, and use that, those data to train AI models that actually seem quite effective uh, here. Um, using a supercomputer, uh, or we might, uh, as uh, Pete uh, Beckman may say more about, because uh, he's very involved in this, um, you know, link uh, instruments and computers and data sources uh, to build, uh, s to study uh, issues of urban uh, resilience. Um, so these are all interesting reasons for wanting to engage in distributed computing. Now, um, if you work in distributed computing, you've probably come across some of these fallacies, the so-called fallacies of distributed computing, which I th were coined by various uh, people involved in, in Sun. Uh, remember Sun? Some of you were still alive when Sun was uh, around, Sun work workstations, Sun microsystems. Um, and these, these people pioneering uh, this idea of linking computers together to build distributed systems within a building, within a city, within a country, um, you know, observed that uh, people building uh, applications for these systems often made uh, you know, foolish mistakes in retrospect when they, when they tried to run things because they, they assumed that distributed computers were similar to parallel computers. Um, so, uh, you know, they, for example, assumed that the network is reliable, um, the network is secure, um, I won't go through these all of, the, all of these things. Um, and, of course, many of these things were obviously uh, fallacies uh, and continue to be fallacies. So bandwidth is still not infinite. Latency is still not zero, um, although it is more bounded than perhaps it used to be. Um, the network is still not homogenous and so on and so forth. But what I'd like to do today is just propose um, that we, you know, as sort of a thing to for us to think about and perhaps talk about to the extent that this is in scope for this meeting is that in some sense these fallacies are no longer as, at least they're not as true as 
they used to be. They're not as fallacious as they used to be, perhaps we could say. Um, and, and this is because, you know, thanks to uh, a series of de developments over the last uh, decade or, or, or perhaps a bit more, we're entering this new era of, uh, you know, universal and reliable communication and computation uh, to a degree that was not really conceivable to think of, think of not that long in the past. And this is really for a few different reasons. Um, one, obviously, is changes in actual communication uh, technologies. So you know, optical fiber is deployed uh, at uh, a vast scale and with a very high degree of redundancy. Uh, cellular radio is you know, continuing to improve in, in capabilities. Um, and, and then there is this fascinating technology called free space optics uh, uh, that is, we think, being deployed, uh, it, we expect to be deployed, uh, which I'll say just a few words about in a second. Um, but they uh, certainly communication not cannot be completely unreliable, cannot be completely reliable uh, and predictable and and fast. But to an extent that previously was not conceivable, it is now uh, to a large degree uh, all of these things. So that's one thing. And then another thing is GPS now universally available, um, except when being jammed by uh, uh, Russians or or, or others um, is. Uh, provides us with highly accurate time signals um, anywhere on Earth, which then allows us to build distributed systems of a different class that maintain highly accurate and highly reliable global state uh, in ways that was not easily possible before. Um, when these technologies are com com combined with uh, widely deployed, highly replicated, highly available cloud services, so I can't guarantee that this computer here is going to stay uh, or be reliable. Uh, it may disappear at any moment, as we just saw. But I can guarantee with high degree of confidence that state that I want to preserve is available with high, high availability uh, and that I can then reach from my computer, if my computer is running to that state, using um, uh, the uh, communication systems that I've been talking about. So that's a, a big change in how we might think about computing. So we might, it will be fun to talk about what, the, what that means. Um, and oh, here's, here's just a couple of examples of you know, what networks look like. So this is ESNet, the Energy Sciences Network in the US. I don't have an old one uh, to show you, but you, know, you can see it's a highly redundant and also a highly high speed uh, network. Um, the Variation in latency that you see uh, between any two pairs of paths is far lower than it used to be. It's still, you can still cut some of these links and you'll get some variation, but not a, a great deal. And then uh, if another way of looking at these things that appeals to parallel computing people was to talk about the bisection bandwidth of the network. So this is, uh, you know, in the last 30 years, it's gone up by uh, eight orders of magnitude, the bisection bandwidth from... Uh, What's that? Uh, five terabits per second up to 500,000 uh, gigabits uh, per, per second. So another measure of how networks have changed. Oh, and a bit, just a bit about uh, free space optics. Does anyone here, I'm sure there's, there's probably someone here who actually knows something about it more than I do, but put your hand up if you do. Yes. Good. So we can talk more about it at, at the break. Great. Excellent. So... Uh, Illyria, I've learned, one thing I've learned about it is how to pronounce Illyria, I think. It's, uh, it, it's uh, at least a, a Google spin-out, which, is, if it's still operating, is, uh, aims to build uh, systems that will connect uh, space uh, ground-based uh, devices with uh, space-based uh, platforms and other ground-based devices via uh, free space optics, which, in principle, along with cellular communications, promises to eliminate a lot of the current uh, dark space uh, on the planet in terms of our ability to communicate. So, uh, so apparently the Illyria platform, by the way, which is called Space Time, uh, when it, it used to be called, called Minkowski, and if some of us know who Minkowski, of course, he was an interpreter uh, of, um, of, of Einstein, uh, also a very brilliant scientist himself. Uh, and he, uh, you know, coined this phrase, presumably in the original German, that sounds more uh, dramatic, but uh, 
Henceforth, space for itself and time for itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. Um, so I won't say more about that, but uh, suggest what if we uh, think about um, in a world of universally reliable uh, communications, um, we can start to trade off uh, not space and time, but location of computing and speed of computing in interesting ways. Um, you know, so here's, for example, is in a, using a space-time diagram of a sort, here's a, a computation that uh, done on my local computer that takes uh, um, a hundredth of a second uh, to complete. Um, and here's the same computation performed at another computer, which is twice as fast, but at 500 kilometers distance, and it takes exactly the same time. So the space and, in a sense, location and speed are, are in some sense, uh, interchangeable uh, here. Um, and if we, we may start thinking about where we place computation in terms of such trade-offs uh, going, going forward. And so here's a, a little example of this from a, a friend of mine at Fermilab, Nan, Nan Tran, you know, reported at a, at a meeting a little while ago, you know, how they were accelerating um, some of their trigger analysis on uh, FPGAs, um, nice, nice work, um, you know, they can run their trigger analysis on a local computer in two milliseconds. Uh, the same uh, computation on an FPGA takes 30 milliseconds, but it, just a o minor oddity, but they were performing the uh, FPGA computation on the Amazon cloud, which was uh, uh, 10 milliseconds away, um, 2,000 kilometers, so that took a total of 50 milliseconds, but they still get a 40 times acceleration. So interesting. Uh, example one, here's, a, here's another one that project that we've been involved in with uh, Fermilab, uh, sorry, with Slack uh, and uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, Laboratory. Um, you know, taking uh, data from a uh, synchrotron a light source beamline um, and uh, using, the goal was to use a, another example of AI being useful, using a trained neural network to do very rapid data reduction on uh, the light source data. Um, you can, uh, you know, well, we'll come to how long it takes to um, perform the analysis in a minute, but you can, so you, you collect data periodically, you collect data periodically, you have to retrain the model. You can perform that on your local GPU that you've got in place to perform the actual filtering. That takes... Uh, 20 minutes or so, so it's not very good for, for rapid re, 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 uh, retraining. But on the other hand, if you want to move your data, say, to a Cerebrus CS2 system at Argon, um, that takes you uh, a mere um, 31 seconds. So you can uh, retrain your network in, the, in, a, in a time that's 35 times faster and turns out to be fast enough to uh, perform in, in, in real time uh, uh, in your... Uh, light source uh, application. So we're seeing more and more of these applications, uh, and I think Pete may talk more about them in, in his presentation, uh, where you you can start to trade off time and space, uh, time, yeah, time and location in interesting, interesting ways. So uh, one, some obstacles, though, arise when you're trying to build such distributed applications. Um, you could fall them generally challenges of friction um, we we want to be able to run a, a computation wherever it makes wherever the computer is the fastest, take into account distance. So we want to move our data from wherever it is located to where it needs to be in order to perform a computation. But all sorts of things get in the way from doing that. Um, and so an interesting question that uh, we've been looking at is. How do you eliminate those sources of friction so that data can move as fast as it can, you know, given light speed uh, constraints, um, without barriers of authentication, uh, data movement uh, protocols, etc. Et, et um, and uh, so, if we have, our ch challenge then is to, uh, we th if we think of distributed computing in this new uh, Minkowski error as being a co-design problem. How do you design your infrastructure and your, uh, and your applications 
than um, three obstacles to tackling them. We want to be able to act on resources, uh, for example, to perform a computation or to move data, uh, regardless of location and interface. We want to be able to ensure reliability, and as I sort of hinted earlier, that means taking advantage of the this new global cloud fabric that allows us to perform, maintain reliable distributed state, um, and uh, it, despite all sorts of failure uh, problems. And, and then we need to be able to manage who's trusted to do what, when, and where. And those are things that we've been working on over the last few years. So I'll say a few words about how we've, how we've done some of them. So uh, Anting Anywhere is a very, uh, so these are some of the workflows that I showed you uh, earlier. Um, Anting Anywhere is a very, that's a pretty simple, it's a simple software engineering task. We want to be able to ensure that we can invoke actions in any physical location where a computer or a storage system is located. Um, so I won't go into all approaches, but just talk about how we've, uh, we uh, leveraging certainly techniques developed by many, have uh, developed these uh, Globus agents that uh, will allow us to connect to any storage system or any computer system, essentially anywhere in the world, deploy an agent um, that abstracts all local details uh, and that then allows people to uh, operate on that storage system or compute system without uh, any uh, concerns about local local details. Um, the second, you know, much more interesting thing is how do we achieve reliable execution of sets of actions? A, a set of actions could be move data from A to B. That could be run a computation and fetch the data. It could be run a whole workflow sequences of actions. Uh, one involving one transfer, one computer computation, one transfer, etc. So historically, these have been very difficult, uh, achieving reliability, uh, as hinted at by the comments on the fallacies of re reliable of distributed systems, has been very difficult to uh, to, to achieve, um, because uh, any approach that depends on in a state being maintained in one location is inevitably fragile. Any approach that depends on state being in more than one location tends to race, run into problems of consistency. Um, the development in effective and efficient global time, uh, thanks to GPS and the uh, ability to easily and rapidly replicate state and maintain replicated state reliably thanks to uh, global distributed cloud systems change the way we can we're able to approach these problems and we've sort of leveraged that to build a whole series of hosted research supervision services or research services things that maintain state in the cloud uh, using uh, high quality resilient distributed state but operate on these endpoints that we've deployed in many places to do computation uh, or uh, for uh, other 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 actions, and we're starting to see other people do similar things to this in in research services. But I think it's really an opportunity that is needs should be uh, exploited to a much uh, greater extent. We use Amazon Web Services as our platform, but other cloud services uh, could be used in in the same same manner. And then the final thing, which is perhaps not of great importance right now, but one does want to be able to control in this global uh, world of action, actors and actions, actions, action locations, and, and cloud uh, management, who's allowed to perform what actions, when, and where. And one that is not, again, thanks to recent advances in, in uh, distributed computing technology, it doesn't end up being too difficult to, 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 to manage. So we, we built out a a uh, system uh, based on uh, what we call Globus Auth, which uses OAuth plus delegation protocols. Delegation is a vital uh, issue in this context because we want to be able, I want to be able to run programs and give those, delegate to those programs the right to do certain things in certain situations, but not other things or the same thing or in, in, or in other situations. Um, so, you know, a workflow that maybe analyzing uh, data in three different places and publishing the results to a fourth place, it needs rights to do each of those things. But you don't want, if someone grabs those rights, that they can 
uh, perform other things in different situations or even the same things uh, without uh, your, your authority. So I think I'll step through that probably. Um, but it's all about tokens moving around, and it's, uh, it's, it's magical how well, how well it works. And uh, this stuff is being used on a, on a very large scale at this point. Uh, well, billions of access tokens are being uh, issued and, and used to access uh, many distributed computing systems. So, uh, oops. So, in total, um, three sort of three simple ideas, which uh, building on this global fabric that I've referred to already of cloud services and reliable communications, um, we've got the ability to act on resources with these local agents, uh, execute series of individual actions and and uh, multiple action and multiple sequences of actions reliably and manages, manage who's allowed to perform what and where. I particularly like this little icon here, if you can see it. This is, uh, it's not exactly relevant, but it's Sisyphus obviously is delegated to a robot in the task of pushing a, pushing a robot up the hill. So Camus, uh, you know, said we should imagine Sisyphus being happy, you know, with his task of pushing the, the, ro the rock up the hill. I don't know if he's still happy here, no. What's that? Only when he's walking back down. Yeah. So he's got his, I think he's got a coffee there and, and a book anyway. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether this is that good a little cartoon for this action, but it, it just, I liked it so much I had to, to use it. So um, anyway, um, so one of the, what can you do when you, uh, when you have this ability to, uh, when you build a system that will let you anyone perform actions reliably uh, that involve uh, with global extent. So this is, uh, this is uh, one of the things we've built using this model is Globus Transfer, so the Globus Transfer Service, five minutes to go. Okay, very good. I think you're not giving me my full 15, but that's fine with me. I'm happy. I'd rather listen to other people. Um, but I want to go through this. So each of these uh, little things here is a, is a transfer uh, with the, it's sort of a, I think it's a delightful way of presenting it. So this is the transfer size in bytes up to about a petabyte, a few petabytes. Um, this is the gray circle distance between the source and the destination, uh, and the color is the speed. So you can see people doing many tens of gigabytes per second transfer speeds, mostly uh, close by. You can see no one is moving things about 5,000 kilometers. That's roughly the width of the, the large oceans, so there are no places that are, or very few places that are exactly 5,000 uh, kilometers apart and so on. And you see one right out on the right here, uh, the, the longest transfer that was performed was between Lincoln, New, Ze New Zealand, and Lujo, Spain. And if you look at uh, Lujo, this is, this is a, a, an old map from a, actually, a, a, I think a book I had as a kid. Uh, showing the antipodes of New Zealand. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, it's the opposite side of the globe. So Lujo and Lincoln, which is right next to Christchurch, are 19,932 kilometers apart. And the semi-circumference of the Earth is 20,000 kilometers. So they're about as close together as they can get. It's kind of, um, so, sort of a fun thing to show that people are moving things on that global scale. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, those are the two uh, sites that we just uh, looked at, but there are, you know, literally well tens of millions of transfers, and well, it's over more than uh, close to three exabytes, I think, at this point, have been transferred using this service. Um, so maybe I'll oh, it's backwards. Let me go forward. I think I'll skip over the. I was just I was going to explain to you that we do this not just for transfers. We use the same thing to build a universal computing fabric that allows people to compute anywhere. And people are starting to use this to, to do things like privacy and preserving learning, um, distributed execution, th things that we've been doing for decades, but now we can do with high reliability um, thanks to this uh, hybrid cloud uh, local computing architecture. Uh, and we're starting to run various forms of uh, uh, research uh, the automation flows, for example, the one that I just talked about at the beginning, uh, involving data from the Stanford Linear Accelerator 
laboratory is a cloud managed uh, flow of this, of this sort. And I think we're going to we're using the same thing for AI. I won't say more about that, but uh, it's uh, it's a fascinating uh, thing to be doing when you start thinking of the entities that you're linking together as not just being uh, simple computations, but uh, AI agents that can do more sophisticated things. For example, look up a, a certain uh, peptide in, in PubMed and tell you what's known about it. Um, or, uh, you know, query PubMed to find the best uh, potential uh, uh, use for that peptide in a particular antimicrobial setting. So some questions that we could think about uh, if we wanted. Uh, it, so one, it used to be that computers were reliable and networks were unreliable. Um, so now arguably individual computers are unreliable, but networks, at least this hybrid cloud network thing, are actually highly reliable. Um, so how does that change what we do and, and, on what, and how we do it? Um, and then these new global science services that I've talked about make it tr pretty trivial to write programs that integrate resources with high reliability at global scale. So what new things may we want to do in that context? Thank you. Thank you.